thank you very much, everybody, uh, for joining us. This is our first uh, seminar in the seminar series Intelligent uh, Medical Decision Making. We have Dr. Alison Marston. Dr. Marston is a Douglas and Nola Lichman Professor of Cardiovascular Disease in the Departments of Pediatrics, Bioengineering, and Bicortesi Mechanical Engineering at Stanford University. She is a member of the Institute for Mathematical and Computational Engineering. From 2007 to 2015, she was a faculty member in mechanical and aerospace engineering at UCSD. She graduated with a BSc degree in mechanical engineering from Princeton University in 1998 and a PhD in mechanical engineering from Stanford in 2005. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford in bioengineering from 2005 to 2007. Uh, she was the recipient of Borough's Welcome Fund Career Award at the Scientific Interface in 2007 and NSF Career Award in 2011. And she was elected flow of AIMBE and SIAM in 2018, the APSDFD in 2020, and BMES in 2021. Her research focuses on the development of numerical methods for cardiovascular blood flow simulation and application of engineering tools to impact patient care in cardiovascular surgery and congenital heart disease. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Marston, for joining us today, and we are very excited to uh, hear your, listen to your talk. And I know that it's very early uh, in the morning in California. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, great to be here. Let me share my screen. All right, is it looking okay? Yes, great. Perfect. Good. Well, it's great to see so many of you on the uh, on the call today um, and really happy to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work going on in my lab involving patient specific modeling uh, for virtual treatment planning in cardiovascular disease. And um, the main sort of paradigm driving this is, you know, of course, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death worldwide and um, is, uh, is the cause of huge healthcare expenditures uh, in the US economy, over $500 billion annually. Um, and one of the projects I'll tell you about today is in the realm of congenital heart disease, which is actually quite a bit more common than many people think, about one in 100 children are born with a congenital heart defect. Um, and so the, the kind of paradigm that we're looking at is that you know, most current treatment plans are done with a, um, a trial and error approach. And in fact, on the top here, you can see a, a pencil and paper drawing that's, uh, that was actually done by uh, one of our surgeons. Um, and so our aim is to um, replace this with, or you know, augment this surgical knowledge with predictive and personalized computational models. And this should get us away from a one size fits all treatment planning scenario to more of a customized personalized medicine approach. Um, so to illustrate this pipeline, um, I'll show you this video of just the sort of image-based modeling um, pipeline. We generally, you know, if a patient comes in, they generally get a CT scan we can build, or an MRI, we can build a, a custom anatomic model from that scan. Um, and this is using our symvascular open source software. Uh, and then we generally define boundary conditions, create a mesh and run a, a finite element simulation of blood flow uh, in that, a specific patient's anatomy. 
And we apply this platform to a number of different uh, cardiovascular disease and device design areas. Um, I'm going to talk about two applications today, um, which are actually both shown on the right side. Um, so the top one is um, has to do with coronary bypass graft surgery and the issue of vein graft failure after surgery. And the bottom one um, is uh, has to do with pulmonary artery stenosis in patients with congenital heart disease. Um, so we'll get to those in just a second. Our lab also works in a number of different uh, other applications in both adult and pediatric uh, heart disease, including pulmonary hypertension, uh, single ventricle, and lately we've been trying to do some multi-physics models. Um, so these are some simulations of uh, the aortic valve that were done with an immersed boundary method. So, you know, when we think about comparing our finite element simulation approach to more traditional engineering applications that you might be you know, familiar with, of course, the you know, engineering industry routinely uses computational modeling and particularly, you know, finite elements models or computational fluid dynamics for things like aerospace, automotive, weather prediction, um, other types of design. And, and these have become, you know, really widely accepted and, uh, and widely used. When we think about translating some of those existing tools into modeling the cardiovascular system, there are a number of additional um, factors that we need to consider um, you know, when we sort of customize those models uh, for this use. And that is, you know, many, many of the vessels that we're interested in uh, are beyond the limits of imaging resolution. Um, we're dealing with complex materials, soft tissue mechanics. Um, the tissue is living. It can grow, remodel. Um, there are autoregulatory processes. Um, there are multiple physical and physiologic systems involved, um, and particularly when you think about modeling the heart itself. Uh, there are cardiac mechanics, you know, um, contraction of the myocardium, electrophysiology, fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, um, and underlying all of those, you know, in the tissue, there are, of course, biological responses. Um, the, the tissues are typically mechanosensitive, and so there's mechanobiology at play, genetics, cell signaling, um, and those, are, of course, you know, are happening on much smaller scales. And then there are disease factors, so disease progression, clinical risk factors, and, and on top of all of that are many sources of uncertainty having to do with clinical data collection and the various different parameters that get fed into these models. So. You know, this is a very rich area uh, involving potentially model development in all of these different areas. I'm not going to touch on every one of these, but just wanted to sort of set the stage for um, what one can do in, in this area. Uh, in my lab, we also uh, we also do a lot of uh, numerical methods development, and you know the sort of bringing a lot of these simulation tools into the cardiovascular setting requires uh, custom numerics uh, to make things as efficient as possible and uh, physiologically realistic as possible. And so we've done a lot of work in our lab in fluid structure interaction using both um, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian methods and also more reduced uh, models for FSI like the coupled momentum method. Um, Uh, we've also done uh, coupling to reduce order models and then looked at, you know, efficient linear solvers and, uh, and preconditioners that are, uh, that are appropriate for these sort of coupled problems. So I'm going to talk about two different applications today. The first one is in pediatrics. The second one is in adults. Um, and the first one uh, was the topic of a PhD thesis of my student Ingrid, who just recently graduated. Um, and this is looking at, and then she worked with research scientist Wei Guang Yang and uh, a number of uh, pediatric cardiologists and surgeons at Stanford. 
Um, and the issue here is in the realm of pulmonary uh, stenosis in patients with congenital heart disease, um, where we're going to look at virtual stent placement uh, for relieving these stenosis. And so there are two types of patients we're going to look at, um, and these are related in that they both develop peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis in a large percentage of, of patients with these syndromes. Um, so Williams syndrome and Allergeal syndrome are both related to uh, genetic origins. They're both relatively rare, um, but they both have this um, common uh, presentation of pulmonary stenosis in roughly you know, half to two thirds of the patients. And so you can see in the images on the bottom that um, these diseases can produce these sort of spindly like uh, and very asymmetric um, pulmonary arteries uh, with blockages that can be quite distal of the main pulmonary artery. So this is the main uh, MPA coming down here. And then you can see these narrowings that are occurring even fairly far down in the branch vessels uh, in this patient. Um, and of course, you know, if one leaves these with no treatment, this can lead to um, overworking the right ventricle, so pulmonary hypertension. In the case of asymmetry, unequal lung perfusion, and ultimately right ventricular failure in, uh, in some patients. So what are the treatment options for these patients? Well, um, at Stanford, we usually uh, refer them for surgery. And our surgeon, Frank Hanley, is actually known uh, you know, internationally for these very complex pulmonary reconstructive surgeries um, that take many, many hours and require very specialized expertise. Um, he, he has achieved excellent outcomes where he's able to, um, he's been able to demonstrate in clinical studies a, a significant reduction in the RV to LV pressure ratio, so basically restoring the right ventricular pressure uh, towards normal. Um, following the surgery, these pressure ratios stay, um, stay reduced over a long period of follow-up. Uh, and this is a cartoon of these sort of patching procedures that he does, which are quite complex and involve going way down deep into the pulmonary branches. Um, this is not possible at at every institution across the country. Um, this is sort of rare and specialized expertise. And so many, many institutions perform um, stent placement uh, in the cath lab uh, to try to treat these, uh, these patients. And so this involves balloon angioplasty and stent placement. Usually it's limited to the proximal stenoses only because they can't reach with the catheter quite as far down. Um, however, it's led to very mixed and often poor outcomes. Um, so uh, some studies have shown really no change in right ventricular pressures. And then there are risks of uh, sequelae like uh, vessel dissection, rupture, aneurysms, instant restenosis, or um, early, early mortality. So we wanted to um, set out to try to explain some of these discrepancies and really explore, you know, the second treatment option in the computational model. So could stenting in, you know, performed in the right scenario produce um, better outcomes for these patients? And uh, what might be some of the explanation for these poor performance of the stenting procedures? Uh, and so we used some vascular for uh, patient-specific modeling. This is sort of our typical pipeline. Um, we start with, in this case, it was uh, CT scans of these patients. And um, so we start with their medical image data. We draw uh, centerline paths and segmentations. This model is you know, quite complex in this case with a number of pulmonary branches. Um, we mesh the model apply uh, physiologic boundary conditions. In this case, we had a right heart uh, ventricular lump parameter model and uh, RCR Winkessel boundary conditions um, on the outlets. And then we perform uh, CFD simulations. In this case, I think we did FSI with the coupled momentum method. Um, that solves the Navier-Stokes equations, but also I don't have them written here, but coupled to uh, solid mechanics um, 
model of a thin walled structure. Um, for this study, we did uh, boundary condition tuning with a surrogate model. And so, like you can see here, we have a right heart model coupled to the inlet of our PA. Um, and then uh, for outlet boundary conditions, we actually had three Winkessel models in series. This was to model um, different portions of the, um, the uh, distal PA arteries, uh, capillaries and veins. Um, and then uh, in order to tune the boundary conditions for each individual patient, it's very expensive to do this with the 3D model in the loop. And so we, we devised a, a surrogate model that's a simple lump parameter model. Um, because of the presence of the stenoses, we had to use nonlinear resistors uh, for this. And so we tuned a, a first set of resistors to uh, you know, an initial result from the 3D model. You can see the, the matching here. Um, the, the delta P versus Q for these nonlinear resistors that we implemented. And once that was in place, we were able to run a tuning algorithm using Nelder Mead optimization um, to tune all of the inlet and outlet boundary conditions to match a set of clinical data for, uh, for each of the patients in this study. Um, we then performed virtual stenting. So we did two scenarios for each patient. And in the study, we looked at uh, four patients with allogeal syndrome and two patients with Williams syndrome. Um, and so you can see here, we had a pre, uh, pre-operative or pre-treatment model for each of these patients. And then the two scenarios we considered were uh, proximal stenting only, um, that's shown in the first column here, and then a more extensive stenting procedure to try to get at those distal pulmonary blockages. Uh, and so for each patient, we had both of these scenarios and the, the placement of the stents were guided by uh, one of our interventional cardiologists. And so, uh, you know, we were able to virtually place these stents in the models um, and make predictions of the, uh, what would happen after intervention. And this was in terms of, you know, uh, a number of different parameters. Um, how did the cardiac output change? Because, so we could predict this because we had this lump parameter right heart model connected to our inlet. Um, and we do see cardiac output uh, generally increases across all of the patients. Um, and in addition here, you're also seeing on this chart the um, right to left pulmonary flow distribution. So with the right pulmonary flow in orange and the left pulmonary flow in blue. Um, and here you see the results are more mixed. Um, and so, for example, in the first patient, the pulmonary flow distribution actually worsens after the extensive, extensive stenting procedure. Um, and in general, we want this to be, you know, roughly 50-50. And so you could argue that some of these patients' dist pulmonary distribution was improved, but others, um, such as this last one, were actually resulted in, uh, or you know, were made more skewed after the, uh, the intervention. Um, I didn't mention this before, but we also used a pre uh model to adapt the uh, downstream boundary conditions to the changing flow conditions. And so this is meant to model sort of the vasoactive response of the distal pulmonary branches. This had a modest effect on our, uh, on our modeling about, you know, uh, a few percent uh, difference um, in the flow uh, adaptation response. Um, we were primarily interested in the pressure change prediction in these patients. And this is where we actually see start to see the reasons why the stenting is, has not been effective in these patients. And this is really the main outcome of this study is to explain why the um, stenting procedures that are used at many institutions are not producing uh, the desired outcomes. Um, and the reason for this has to do with, uh, with resistance. So if you think about, you know, the pulmonary artery has uh, some resistance in the proximal vessels that are included in our 3D model and then resistance in the distal vasculature. 
Um, and when you're thinking about placing a stent, you're going to make a change in resistance in the, the proximal vessel. Um, but what you're really looking at is, you know, does that affect the total resistance of the, of the model if I just change this one proximal vessel? And what we're seeing here is, um, so you're looking at MPA pressure, RPA pressure, LPA pressure. So these are main pulmonary and right and left pulmonary. And then pre-intervention, um, proximal stenting only, and extensive stenting. And what you can see is that, you know, on average, this is the systolic pressure and this is the mean pressure, we're not getting a lot of change. So even with the most extensive stenting, in some patients we're getting change, but overall, you know, on average, we're not getting a lot of change in pressure, even when we go down and stick stents in the, um, in the more distal pulmonary vasculature. And the reason for this is really that, you know, the um, pulmonary vascular uh, resistance is not changing all that much, uh, even with uh, these stents being placed. Um, we were able to look at post-intervention pressures. Um, so again, some patients are, are we're seeing um, a reasonable change in the pressure level, um, but keeping in mind, you know, this is still about in the range of 50 and, you know, normal pulmonary pressures are more like in the range of 25. Um, so proximal stenting is certainly not sufficient to reduce the pressures. Extensive stenting is reducing them more, um, but not in all patients. So for example, this Williams patient really was not affected significantly by uh, either one of these treatment options. Um, and so this is really highlighting that, you know, if one is going to do these stenting procedures, there's a lot of variability in the response. Um, in general, it seems proximal stenting is not sufficient to reduce pulmonary pressures. More extensive stenting may be sufficient in some patients, but not all patients. Um, and so uh, we think there's value in doing this kind of predictive modeling um, to really stratify patients that, that are you know, the best candidates for this type of uh, treatment. Um, we were also able to make pulmonary resistance maps. And so we could highlight, you know, um, if you're going to do one of these procedures, you should prioritize the areas that are going to achieve the, the most bang for your buck. So um, the, you know, the, the lesions with the highest potential to reduce the total resistance. And so these are shown in red. So we're thinking that these sort of maps could be given to the interventional cardiologist to target and order or prioritize um, the lesions to go after first. Okay, I want to jump, I'm just going to look at the times. So it looks like we're doing okay here. Um, so I'm going to jump to the second project, which has to do with coronary artery bypass surgery and the question of vein graft failure um, following these uh, surgical procedures. Um, and this is in the context of, you know, we, we know that in cardiothoracic and vascular surgery, um, we often implant uh, various types of, of conduits or tissues. Um, and vascular grafts and engineered tissues are both mechanosensitive and can undergo remodeling when they're placed in a new environment. Um, and so in the case of, uh, you know, we have projects going on in our lab that involve both um, venous grafts, like in coronary bypass graft surgery, and also um, synthetic, like tissue engineered grafts, uh, collaborators are working on. Um, and we're really interested in how um, hemodynamics models and vascular growth and remodeling models can be combined to assess, um, you know, the progression of some of these implanted conduits following surgery. And so we're going to talk about um, coronary bypass graft surgery now. Of course, coronary artery disease is a leading cause of death uh, in the U.S. And um, coronary bypass surgery is, you know, despite the increase in, in uh, coronary stenting, um, cabbage or coronary bypass graft surgery is still the gold standard procedure for patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. And uh, 
the surgery is performed in about 350 patients uh, every year in the US. Um, and when they perform the surgery, um, the preference is to use arterial grafts. Um, these offer, so such as the internal mammary artery, that's, um, they pull this down from one of the head and neck vessels and attach it as a bypass graft below a coronary blockage. Um, however, these have really limited availability. We all have only one or two of these that can be used. And so 95% of cabbage surgeries also require the use of a saphenous vein graft. And that's shown here in blue. Um, they typically harvest this vein out of your leg and then um, they put it into the coronary circulation. So they basically pick a vein in your leg that you don't need. Um, they usually attach it uh, just above the aortic root and then that again comes down just below a coronary blockage um, to provide, basically revascularize the myocardium. Um, unfortunately, these vein grafts fail at alarmingly high rates. And so this is the main clinical problem that we're dealing with in this project. Um, about 25% of them will fail within a year to a year and a half and about 50% within five to 10 years. Um, and there are no current clinical solutions for this, apart from watching and waiting and hoping that the veins uh, remain patent. So part of what's causing this is the drastic change in biomechanical loading that these veins uh, experience when they're harvested out of the leg and implanted into the coronary circulation. And you can think about, you know, the vein is living in your leg, it's under very low pressure, low shear stress conditions. And right now, um, the vein experiences basically a step change uh, in loading conditions where the pressure is increased about 20 fold and the shear stress is increased about four fold when they, when they implant it in the coronary circulation and undo these surgical clamps. And so this unleashes a complex remodeling process that's a response to this very drastic and sudden change in mechanical loading. And so we wanted to look at this, um, at this problem of vein graft failure. Um, we have approached this using two types of modeling. One is our traditional hemodynamics models using some vascular. And then the second one are growth and remodeling models that we adopted in collaboration with uh, Jay Humphrey's lab at Yale. Um, so the first thing we set out to do was let's just quantify, you know, what are, the ex what are the conditions experienced by these vein grafts um, in, uh, natively in cabbage patients. And so we, again, adopted our symvascular modeling pipeline. Um, we built these from CT images. Um, so load the stack of CT images into symvascular. We can draw um, center line paths and segmentations uh, down all the vessels of interest. And this includes the native coronaries where we could see them, both types of graphs, the IMA up here and the SVG and the aorta with the head and neck vessels. Um, we mesh the models with an unstructured tetrahedral mesh. Um, we assigned boundary conditions. Um, those, are, those values are shown here. Um, and then in each of these patients, we used a closed loop model that includes a um, coronary outlet boundary condition, um, as well as a heart model and uh, Winkessel models at the outlets of the aorta and the head and neck vessels. We performed um, an automated tuning algorithm to tune the values of these um, circuit elements in you know, so the, this is basically a set of ODEs that are governing these circuits um, and they have a bunch of parameters. Um, so for each of these patients, we collected uh, quite a bit of data from echocardiography, from blood pressure cuff measurements, um, and then we ran a, a tuning algorithm to, you know, using optimization to match uh, to those patients' clinical data. Uh, and then we performed FSI simulations. Um, the primary result of this study was to show the very large differences in flow conditions that are experienced by arterial versus venous grafts, um, sort of to lay the stage for, you know, why do these grafts have such different performance? Um, 
And we saw you know, significant differences in time averaged wall shear stress. So this is comparing uh, arterial uh, IMA graphs versus venous graphs, uh, saphenous vein. We see higher shear stress in the arterial graphs. We see a similar uh, oscillatory shear index. Um, we see higher atheroprone area in the venous graphs and also higher wall strain uh, in the arterial graphs. Okay, so with those kind of baseline conditions known, we then started to ask the question, um, what is the response of these vein graphs, um, you know, knowing that this remodeling process occurs, could we actually try to model that process uh, under different conditions? And so we adopted the uh, working together with Jay Humphrey uh, in a series of papers, we adopted uh, the constrained mixture uh, model that was developed by Jay's lab. Um, this basically contains a, a, a mixture of collagen, elastin, and smooth muscle. Uh, in a continuum uh, formulation. And then basically one applies a hemodynamic perturbation and can use the model to predict the long time response, typically three to 500 days um, in radius thickness and composition of the walls uh, as a result of these uh, perturbations in flow or pressure. And so we could ask then, you know, what is the biomechanical response to this altered hemodynamics uh, in a vein graft? And what we did that hadn't been done before was um, adapt these models for use in veins. So Jay's lab had primarily looked at arteries, and then we worked together to, um, to adapt the parameters and functional forms appropriately for use uh, in a vein. And then we asked the question, what if we could change this step change in loading into a gradual change in loading using uh, some methods such as external support on the vessel? Um, and you know, what would the response look like? And so we ran these growth and remodeling models. This is what they look like mathematically. There's a set of equilibrium equations, a set of constitutive equations, um, mass addition and removal, and then evolution of mass and stored energy. And um, this is where the fluid mechanics comes in in these two terms here. The circumferential stress that comes from the pressure with a gain parameter and the shear stress uh, that comes from the flow through the vessel um, again with a, a gain parameter. Okay, so we ran this model in a couple of different scenarios. Um, we wanted to look at, you know, the original sort of step change in loading condition and compare that to what if we could load the vein more gradually. So, you know, slowly ramp up the change in flow or pressure and get the vein used to its new mechanical conditions. Um, and we could do that over uh, different periods of time. And so we looked at what if we apply this gradual loading over three days uh, or perhaps over eight days. Um, and so what you're looking at here is a map of how much do we perturb the flow versus how much do we perturb the pressure. Um, and this corner up top is the 20X change in pressure and the 4X change in flow that I was referring to. Um, so this, is, this, this upper corner is sort of typical to, of a vein graft. And all of the red X's are the point where our model predicted failure of the vein graft due to something like unbounded growth of the tissue. Um, and that might occur, for example, when the vein, when the vein graft develops a stenosis uh, and becomes occluded. Um, and so what we see is a reduction in the number of red X's if we gradually load for three days um, postoperatively. And what you're, you know, what's interesting to point out is that gradual loading over three days produces a change at three to 500 days later. And so all of the dots that you're seeing in these graphs are the results of growth and remodeling simulations out at 500 days, um, where the vein graft has been put on a different remodeling sort of pathway or trajectory resulting from this immediate post-operative change in loading conditions. Uh, and then the model also predicted um, elimination of the failure if we gradually, gradually loaded for um, eight days. 
We also included inflammation in the model um, and then did a follow up study where we looked at actually including an external support device um, in the model and um, this can be biodegradable uh, with varying rates of degradation. Um, or it could be permanent and there's actually been a clinical trial in the past of a permanent metal device um, that was used. What uh, what we found was that. Um, Leaving the device in place for too long led to chronic inflammation in our model and uh, also led to luminal encroachment. Um, our model also uh, predicted that the um, vessel stiffness would increase uh, in the presence of this external support. So, with this modeling as inspiration and, you know, the idea that we could actually significantly affect the remodeling trajectory of these vessels using an external support. Um, we actually set out to prove this or to do a proof of concept study in a sheet model. And so we um, we used a, a surgical procedure where you basically swap a section of the carotid artery with a jugular vein. And so if you stick a section of jugular vein into the carotid artery, it's a model for, you know, what happens when you put a vein in a high pressure, high shear environment and then let it remodel over time. Um, and this is up in the neck uh, of the sheep. Um, we wrapped half of these veins with a, a vicral mesh that was degradable. Um, so that's basically like a surgical mesh. It's like a cloth and we wrapped the vessel um, with it, we had a control group, a control group that was unwrapped, and then a group that was uh, that received the wrap. We did this in sheep, and we followed the sheep for four months. And at the end of the study, we did mechanical testing, RNA sequencing, histology, um, and simulations to look at wall shear stress. You can already see that the control group on the top with no wrap, so we'll call them the no wrap group. Um, had a highly variable response um, and uh, one of the vessels became aneurysmal, one of them completely occluded. Um, there's a large variation in the diameter that resulted. Um, the group that was wrapped on the bottom, on the other hand, uh, was much more uniform in appearance, uh, had more uniform vessel diameters and, and uh, we avoided these two scenarios of stenosis and, uh, and aneurysm. And these results actually just came out a couple days ago um, in a paper in active biomaterial. Uh, we sent the tissue to the Humphrey lab for mechanical testing. Um, so these sheep studies were performed at Stanford um, under the guidance of Jack Boyd, uh, who's one of my surgeon, surgeon colleagues. Um, we shipped the tissue to Yale for mechanical testing. Um, and we definitely see some trends uh, in terms of thickness. Um, so you can see the non wrap vessels in pink um, were uh, thicker than the wrapped vessels in blue. We also looked at diameter, um, circumferential stress. So we see some trends here. Um, we also see a difference in stiffness. Um, you can see the wrapped vessels in um, in blue versus the non wrapped in pink. And so this agrees with our model prediction um, that I mentioned before. Um, looking at histology, we see a statistical significance in uh, the, the amount of collagen that's deposited. Um, so the wrapped vessels had uh, more collagen deposition uh, than the non wrapped vessels. And this may also explain the difference in stiffness uh, of the vessels. And we also saw trends in, um, in gags uh, that were measured in the histology um, uh, and also in area and uh, a wall ratio. Um, we performed subject specific CFD simulations uh, in in a subset of these um, for, for the sheep that we were able to image. Um, this was during COVID and so we weren't able to image all of the sheep because some of the labs were shutting down at the time. But um, uh, we 
see, you know, the luminal area for the non wrapped vessels was highly variable. The wrapped vessels had a nicely uniform response uh, in luminal area. And then, of course, the um, shear stress. Um, you know, was highly variable in the um, in the non wrapped vessels. Uh, compared to uh, the wrapped vessels. And so again, you know, the main takeaway here is just a much more predictable response from the wrapped vessels in terms of uniform shear um, compared to the unwrapped controls, which had a high variation. Um, we also performed RNA sequencing on the tissue. Um, we again saw high variability in the response uh, in the non wrapped vessels compared to the wrapped graphs. We saw 52 genes downregulated and two upregulated in the wrapped vessels compared to non wrapped. Um, the genes that were downregulated in the wrapped graphs included um, things related to you know, ECM proteins, collagen, thrombospondin, fibrillin 2, TGF beta signaling. Um, and so all of these indicate that the wrapped vein grafts may be less prone to smooth muscle cell proliferation and migration, neointimal formation, endothelial cell activation, and inflammatory response um, compared to the non wrapped grafts. And this, so this may, you know, this kind of gets at some of the actual biological mechanisms that are at play during, um, during this adaptive process of the veins. That are in line with what we're seeing in you know the histology, the mechanical testing, and in our um, in our computational models. So again, that you know the computational models are not predicting changes at the genetic or cellular level necessarily, but um, but we can see you know things like inflammatory response or change in stiffness that are then you know in line with what we're seeing at this uh, genetic response level here. Um, just a quick mention that sort of the next step in this process is development of a fluid solid growth solver. Um, so this is coupling our symvascular fluid structure interaction models with a three dimensional implementation of J. Humphreys growth and remodeling models. Um, we are aiming to eventually apply this to uh, vein graphs. Um, and um, but we have so far applied it to tissue engineered vascular graphs. And here you can see an example where um, we we simulated the progression of a tissue engineered vascular graft that was you know an inflammatory mediated re response in the first 30 days or so, and then a mechanum mediated response that actually resolves the stenosis that forms um, out to 180 days. And this is a comparison against some actual sheep data where we ran simulations in models that were directly um, built from image data in sheep who were receiving these graphs. And so this is, I think, just a, mentioning this as an exciting new uh, direction in uh, sort of the next step of growth remodeling simulations. Um, I'll just spend the last couple of minutes, I think we're just about out of time, um, Uh, talking about some recent tools in uncertainty quantification uh, that I feel are very important in the cardiovascular modeling uh, field in general, um, because we do have these, you know, many, many sources of uncertainty that are fed into, um, into our models. And this really comes in two steps. So the first one is a parameter estimation step. Um, in which we're you know, assimilating clinical data into the model. And then the second step is an uncertainty propagation step where we're running simulations, say sampling from a set of uh, uncertain parameters and then wanting to quantify confidence intervals on the predictions that our simulations are making. So um, we have developed tools for all of these. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail and I know we're just about out of time here. Um, but one of the tools that in UQ that I'm most excited about is the use of multi-level multi-fidelity methods. Um, so traditional Monte Carlo is too expensive for our models, um, but we can actually leverage the presence of 
a couple of readily available reduced order models uh, for cardiovascular models. So we know that you know, the 3D finite element models give us amazing local resolution, but are very computationally expensive. Um, but we also have at our disposal one dimensional wave propagation models and also zero dimensional lump parameter model representations of the same um, anatomy. And so my student Casey, who actually just submitted her dissertation yesterday, um, has set up a, a hierarchy of these um, multi level, multi fidelity models. She did this uh, by coupling basically the synvascular. 0D, 1D, and 3D solvers with Dakota, which is an open source package released by and developed by Sandia National Lab. Um, and so the Dakota driver basically uh, runs these multi level, multi fidelity UQ scenarios by calling our some vascular solvers. So the fidelity levels would be these 0D, 1D, and 3D solvers, and the multi level would be like a coarse or fine grained version of each of these. And that can be something like mesh resolution, um, for example, that gives you the different levels, fine, medium, or coarse. And so she implemented this multi-level, multi-fidelity uh, UQ method um, and has a nice publication from a couple of years ago um, and another one coming out. Um, it basically demonstrated that if you run just a few 3D simulations, but many 1D and 0D simulations, um, you can drastically reduce the computational cost of doing uncertainty quantification. And so and we were able to get actually a couple of orders of magnitude cost reduction um, by running, say, thousands of 0D simulations. And the, the main sort of uh, trick here is that you know the 0d and 1d or the lower fidelity models just have to be statistically correlated with the 3d models but don't have to be completely accurate as long as you have a reasonable correlation and we were we did have correlations sort of in the 90 percent range um, here and so uh, we're able to achieve really nice speed up um, a couple orders of magnitude speed up in um, in computational cost of our UQ by leveraging these available models. Um, we've also done some recent work on deep learning um, for automating the image segmentation process. So anybody who's used some vascular knows that the, the most painful part of it often is the model construction where you have to trace by hand um, the outline of the vessel lumen at multiple locations. Um, so we actually have a vascular model repository and um, we have recently developed a new website and released about 100 models um, that are freely downloadable on the website. Um, and so we actually used the data in the vascular model repository for as a training set for this uh, machine learning uh, network. Um, so we had about 16,000 training images. These are from 2D slices of these 100 models um, in the repository, you know, all the slices of all the vessels, um, and trained a ves vessel regression uh, uh, deep learning network. Um, we were able to get, um, you know, dice scores in the sort of 90, 95% range. Um, we looked at a, a performance in larger vessels, which was very good. We got a little bit not quite as good performance in the smaller vessels, which is not surprising um, due to resolution. But this has been implemented as a module in SimVascular and is available for people to use. Um, and then building on that, you know, using this trained network, we actually were able to perform uncertainty quantification on the geometry. Um, and we did this using Bayesian dropout networks. So what this means is that you basically um, drop out one of the um, connections at, one at a time in the convolutional neural network um, and then recreate uh, the segmentation. And so this then produces sort of a family with these different dropout um, dropped connections in the network. It produces a family of models whose uncertainty stems directly from the image data that you're segmenting. Um, and then we can build for each of these, um, we can basically sample from those to build 
of different families of 3D models with uh, varying uncertainty. Um, and so we did this in a recent paper that's cited here. Um, and then again, produced confidence intervals in our simulation results. So for each of those geometric models, we can run a CFD simulation, you know, sampling from those distributions and then quantify the statistics on the output predictions of things like shear stress, pressure, um, and other quantities that we're interested in predicting. Um, and so those details are in the paper here, but you can see that we get these confidence envelopes on our um, simulation predictions of things like uh, flow pressure waveforms and time average well shear stress. Um, so I'll just wrap it up here. I wanted to mention two open science resources for cardiovascular biomechanics that are uh, supported by my group, and there's also uh, uh, many other people involved in this. So the Symvascular Open Source Project at symvascular.org. Um, this provides the whole pipeline from medical imaging through to simulation. Um, we have had a lot of support from the NSF for this project, um, and we also have a gateway for educational use that may be of interest. Um, so this basically provides high performance computing resources through Exceed uh, via a web portal. Um, and so if, if folks are interested in using that, um, please reach out to me. We have a, a former student of mine is sort of running um, that uh, project. Uh, that's Justin Tran. Um, and then the vascular model repository I mentioned, um, you should check out our new website. We have about 100 some vascular projects that are freely downloadable. Um, and the idea here is to support uh, machine learning applications, medical device design, reduced order modeling projects. Um, and, and these are in a range of different anatomies. Um, so just to summarize, I showed you that stenting in uh, patients with peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis, uh, we think has insufficient effect and in some patients may do more harm than good. Um, I also talked about uh, our exploration of gradual loading via external support as a promising avenue for preventing vein graft failure. Um, and we observed significant changes in stiffness, morphology, histology, gene expression, and mechanical stimuli. Um, so we feel that this combination of, of CFD plus growth remodeling um, Approaches can yield increased insight into mechan mechanobiology, and this is likely true across a range of different applications. And then finally, I feel that uncertainty quantification is really needed in the field to assess confidence in simulation predictions. And so we've been really driving forward on, on developing um, some of those tools. So I'll wrap it up with acknowledgments, um, particularly my students who, um, who you know, did all the work that I showed you. Um, the major players on these uh, two projects are highlighted in blue. We have a number of engineering collaborators as well as clinical collaborators and then a variety of funding sources that I'd like to acknowledge. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Outstanding presentation, very interesting results. Uh, I appreciate it. So, is is there any questions in the audience? If there is any question, please feel free to unmute and uh, introduce yourself and ask your questions. Yes, Emily, please. Hello, thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, my lab uh, is in the biomedical engineering at UC Davis. I'm Emily Roncalli. Oh, hi, uh, how are and, you? I've heard about good. you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hopefully in, in good terms. Yes, by I met oh, one of your students at the UC Davis Symposium. Right, you met Carlos as well. So yeah. you already know that we're Symbascular users. Yeah. And I had a question about, um, you know, uh, the tuning of your boundary conditions when you discuss uh, the pediatric project yeah. and how you were doing it for each patient. How long does it take when you have to fine tune your the surrogate model? So. Um, once you, once you develop the 0D surrogate, then running, you know, running the tuning with the 0D is very fast because then you're basically just doing 
a zero D surrogate coupled to other zero D models and those run super fast. And so then it's just a matter of setting that up with the optimization methods. Um, so it should, I, I would say it's more a matter of the time it takes to sort of set it up than to actually run it. And um, we would be happy to you know, provide, if there's stuff that's not in the open source version, we would be happy to chat with you and send you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank <laughs> send you. you stuff. It looks like you helpful. have a lot of um, metrics to compare with uh, the clinical data. So I was also curious, I am uh, squeezing in a second question. Yeah, yeah. Um, on your validation metrics, because we all know that validating our CFD is really difficult, especially in patients. Yeah. I would guess in pediatric patients, it must be even more challenging to get data. So how, yeah. what type of data are you able to get from the patients to validate? So I didn't show it in the talk, but for, uh, I think it was only two patients in the study of those six patients that I showed you. We actually did have, um, some pressure measurements um, post procedure that we compared against. And so we discussed that a little bit in one of our papers. Um, there's, we're, we're investigating validation against a sheet model from some data of a pulmonary stenosis that was collected by a collaborator's lab. Um, and then the other thing that we do, you know, in general is sort of uh, in vitro models that are 3D printed and then put in 4D MRI. Um, okay. We've done some of that recently with Dan Ennis's lab at Stanford um, in an aorta model. So we haven't done the, well, actually we've just submitted a paper in involving in vitro validation of a pulmonary valve. Um, so pulmonary outflow tract with a valve where we did 4D MRI on the 3D printed model with a pump with flow going through it. Um, I yeah, and so I, I think that that sort of supplements what what you can get from the clinical side, which is often very limited, as you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, Mieta and I had, um, uh, just when COVID shut, shut us down, we had a 3D printed um, structure on his desk that I still have uh, that we never really tested. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I don't want to take too much time because I want to leave time for other questions, but I'll definitely reach out. Um, yeah, I'll yeah, reach you. out. We're so not much. very far away, so I would love to chat with you more. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions from the audience? So uh, I would like to ask a uh, maybe a higher level question. You showed some interesting results on uh, how these uh, predictive model, mod models using uh, computational models, they can help in uh, answering some questions or for example, in that pediatric project or the second project that you presented before the treatment or before the uh, operation surgery. So, yeah. Uh, how far do you think we are from using these models, these computational models in clinics, in clinical settings, mm -hmm. considering that maybe there are some resistances, some, you know, inertia in the clinical setting in order to adopt new, new methods. And maybe also there are some, uh, some, you know, limitations. As, as you mentioned regarding the computational cost of some of some of these methods that you add, yeah. for example, using reduced model. Yeah, I think um, I think we're not that far from clinical implementation, but we have to be very careful about validation and about you know uh, making sure that we have sufficient clinical data to inform the models that we do deploy. Um, of course, there are, um, there is a major commercial effort by HeartFlow, um, which is uh, deploying, you know, they're FDA approved to perform computational modeling for coronary artery disease. And they're looking at, you know, fractional flow reserve. Um, that's a, a Silicon Valley company. Um, 
and founded by Charlie Taylor, who is my postdoc advisor, I should say. So um, there is a success story in commercialization. They are clinically deploying this you know, routinely um, right now, and they have a number of major clinical trials. Um, I think that you know, they've been able to speed up their pipeline significantly with machine learning. Um, and that's partly because they're focused on very you know, laser focused on the coronary arteries. I think it gets a little bit harder if you're to looking at something like pediatrics, where you have this really heterogeneous pa patient population. And um, it's much harder to sort of scale up the machine learning, just be even just because of the lack of availability of training data, for example. Um, but I do, you know, at Boston Children's Hospital, they are deploying, they have a, a team of uh, about 15 um, engineering staff who are routinely running CFD simulations for the hospital. Um, and so I, I think it is possible to clinically deploy. We just need to be, you know, really mindful of validating the recommendations that we're making um, to the clinicians if it involves real patients. And anything, of course, commercialized would need to go through the FDA for, uh, for approval, which is, um, you know, HeartFlow kind of paved the way for approval of simulation technologies, which hadn't been done before. Um, so there are some additional hurdles there, I think. Thank you very much. Other questions? So I think uh, we are almost, uh, it's, it's actually 10.02 and 8.02 in California. So I really appreciate your time and uh, your talk. Thank you so much for uh, presenting this interesting research, these interesting research projects to us today. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being with us in the seminar series uh, today. We will have Dr. Reza Shadmeh from Johns Hopkins University, which will give us the next talk at the end of uh, September. I'm, I, I will send information about that talk uh, maybe next week or in two weeks. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Nice to see you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.